Um, so first of all, I would like to say that I'm very happy uh, with the opportunity to share my work with you this evening at CCA, which is, as you know, is an institution that's not only nurturing and preserving uh, the fields, the culture of architecture, but in fact pushing its boundaries. So it's really an uh, honor to be here. I'm very thankful. So I'd like to thank especially my colleague in the beer uh, for making that possible. Uh, the title of my lecture, actually, when I saw the exhibition, I kind of changed a little bit the topic, but I hope uh, I will cover uh, everything that I need to cover, that I'll have time to do that. Um, so recently, uh, my work has been de dealing with, uh, 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 with forests, and architecture is a discipline that's not very much interested in forests, insofar as forests are described as that which lacks architecture, that which lacks human design. That is to say, forests are somehow the negative space of the city. They're the space of nature. They're, in fact, the space against which the city is going to define itself as the space of history, as the space of culture, as the space of the political. But I want to challenge this view a little bit, and I want to show you how we can read this landscape as architecture. And in order to do this, uh, I'm going to um, show you some projects that I have been involved with. The first project is called The Habitat, because it departs from an architectural magazine called Habitat that was created by the Italian-Brazilian architect Lina Bobardi in the 50s. It's important to give you some background so you can understand a little bit more about the context of this project. So similar to other trends in modern art developed by the European avant-garde, Brazilian modernism would appropriate the figure of the primitive as an aesthetic and cultural resource. That is to say, to use the words of a famous text by Hal Foster, Brazilian modernism also has a primitive unconscious. But in fact, this was a very conscious and deliberate articulation. The key difference was that, different from Europe, in Brazil, as one of the most important avant-garde artists put at the time, the primitive was a real element, meaning Brazil is inhabited uh, by uh, several indigenous nations like, uh, uh, like Canada. Uh, hence, the figurations of primitiveness uh, uh, became not only an aesthetic resource to a particular, uh, became not an aesthetic resource to modernism as such, but to a particular form of modernism, since it was perceived and mobilized as a, sort, as a source of national tradition or national identity. So this is an important context uh, for uh, this project, the kind of appropriation of the figure of the primitive. The other important information relates to architect Lina Bobardi, which I don't know if you know her, so it's important to speak a little bit about her. Uh, Lina is a key figure within the uh, scenario of modern art in Brazil. Indeed, she's one of the most brilliant minds of her generation, and not only as an architect, but as a curator, as a designer, and as the founder and editor of this magazine, Habitat. Habitat was one of the most important means by which modern art was debated and diffused in Brazil after the Second World War. It can be described as a militant publication which sought, sought to teach the elites of the urban centers what was modern art and what was to be modern. As such, Habitat not only propagated images of European avant-garde uh, and the image of uh, the, the, the kind of very uh, prolific um, uh, modernist uh, art that was produced in Brazil at the time, but it also brought to the urban elites the image of native forms of cultural expression. To be modern was to be connected with the new language and also to primitiveness. So uh, these are some images of, uh, of, of, of Habitat. Uh, uh, and this project departs from these images and these imaginaries. When I was an architecture student, I was startled by the way this image of primitive art appeared in Habitat and other militant modernist publications. So here you see uh, uh, titles such as uh, the Indian uh, designer or the Indian fashion designer, the Indian artist, uh, uh, and, and all these this images of, uh, of, uh, of objects collected from, from these populations would, would appear uh, in these magazines. And I was very uh, uh, attracted by that. 
uh, um, and I want to understand those images. And what we see in these pages is that these objects, pottery, masks, ornaments, sculptures, body paintings, they are displayed somehow as isolated entities, detached from their context, in a similar way as they are displayed in an ethnographic museum representing the other. Naturally, displayed in these pages as they are, these objects ask an unavoidable question. How could they appear in a publication such as Habitat? What was the historical context that allowed them and their image to be transported and translated as iconic reference of national modernism? The historical context, the historical context that allowed them to circulate can be summarized by what the Brazilian state called a politics of pacification of indigenous peoples. Starting in the 20s, at the same time as artists and cultural producers were elaborating this link between modernism and primitiveness, the Brazilian state launched an aggressive project of colonization towards the interlands of the country. As it was, the objective of this state-led campaign to occupy what was called territorial voids of the Brazil continental territory uh, 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 employed a kind of specific state agency that would make contact with this population and try to teach them uh, to become national citizens. So I'm going to show what we're seeing are some images of these archives of, of these pacifications expeditions, which were intensively documented, filmed, and photographed. And photographed. So basically what this, these missions would do, they would uh, 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 establish what they call indigenous posts, and they would uh, try to collect these people and concentrate them in these indigenous posts so they could be uh, settled, they could be fixed in the land, and therefore their lands could be opened up for this project of modern colonization. And if you see this agency that was in charge of it, it was called the Service for the Protection of the Indian. They had uh, what they called indigenous posts, which were in fact uh, very similar to a kind of colonial strategy of controlling indigenous population. As you see, they had it all over Brazil. So basically they were collecting, concentrating these people and kind of opening up their lands uh, uh, for uh, this project of uh, frontier expansionism. So the objects that would appear in the pages of Habitat, they were collected during those expeditions. In other popular publications that were not this type of militant modernist publications, but that also circulated at the time, the colonial context of these expeditions was emphasized, showing these frontier missions as a heroic civilizational project that was being diffused through the wild interlands. In Habitat, the Indians appeared as isolated entities, different from these publications. As you can see here, they would appear always in, in reference to this uh, uh, modernist art. So in other words, there existed a sort of process of erasure of this colonial context that operated by these medias, which allowed these images and objects to appear as reference to the development of a modern vocabulary, although they were somehow fundamental, fundamentally colonial. So I became interested in trying to excavate the historical context from which these objects emerged and could circulate in publications such as Habitat. One of the indigenous groups that most often was depicted in Habitat was the Karaja people. And they are very famous because of this uh, dolls that they make that you can see on the left hand side. And what's interesting about the Karaja is that they would have a very particular relationship with the city, the modernist capital of Brazil, of Brazil called Brasilia. You can see here, Brasilia uh, on the bottom, and they would live uh, near that land. It's called Cristalândia, San Antonio, which is a, a very big island, a kind of fluvial island, river island, one of the largest river islands in the world. And, uh, and I was trying to see, well, how, what, what was happening in their land uh, while these objects were being published in these magazines. So while Brasilia was being built, President Juscelino Kubitschek, who also built the modernist capital of Brazil, commissioned the same architect, Oscar Niemeyer, to design a large tourism complex in the Bananao Island, which is uh, the traditional land uh, of the Karaja people. So I'm going to read uh, an excerpt of this uh, uh, news that were published at the same time. Brasilia, it says, between hell and paradise. For the pessimists, a warning. There are no more Indians or Jaguars around Brasilia. 
For those who dream about adventures in the jungle, the destination is the island of Bananao, the land of the Karaja, where the Karajas are well schooled in the tourism industry. So here we can see two things. First and again, a process of erasure. No more Indians in Brasilia, which implies that Brasilia was before indigenous land. And second, the idea that the experience of modernism was intimately, intimately related with an experience of the wild and the primitive. So the construction of this hotel was called Operation Bananao, and it's important to, for us to understand that this term operation, uh, it's a kind of military term, and it was in fact a kind of military uh, uh, expedition because the military was mobilized to really uh, 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 open up this land for the construction of this tourist complex. This is one of the few images uh, of the complex that survived. In the foreground, we see the hotel and its ad ad adjacent facilities here. And in the background, we see one of the villages of the Karaja people. The relation with the primitive and the wild, which was so essential to the development of national modernism, was translated into an architectural display. From the windows of the modernist hotel designed by Nehemiah, the Indians could be observed as if they were displayed in a museum. The objects made by the Karaja, here's one image of, the, of this hotel. The objects made by the Karaja, they're also exhibited inside the hotel in a similar way as they appeared in the magazine Habitat. Framed by modern design, they represent ethnographic objects aesthetic resources of primitiveness isolated from the history to which they bore witness. Modern design function as a tool to erase or break out the violent colonial context by which this experience of the primitive was fabricated in the collective subjectivity of a nation that aspired to be modern, but, but which was and is still fundamentally colonial. The Karaja people also play an important role in Brasilia, in the construction of Brasilia. This is an image of the first mass in Brasilia. They organized a Catholic mass to celebrate the inauguration of the town. And the Karaja people was brought, these are the only images of this mass, it's a film, some stills of the film. And you can see the Karaja people over there. They were brought by the military force uh, uh, from their land to be part of this Catholic mass. And this Catholic mass is somehow a reenactment of the first mass celebrated by the Portuguese when they invaded uh, the land of the Amerindian people in, in, in the 1500. So there is a kind of relationship which is uh, uh, fundamentally colonial in the way that modernism was developed. And Brasilia perhaps uh, is one of the uh, most important examples of it. This is the uh, ground zero of Brasilia. And as uh, the urban planner of Brasilia would say, it was born out of the primary gesture of one who marks or takes possession of a place. Two axes crossing at the right angle, the very sign of the cross. In Habitat, these images would appear again as symbols of the culture of indigenous people. But if we see uh, the, demograph the demography of this particular group, we would see that at the moment where the objects were taken from their land, they were in a historic demographic low. These images that appear in Habitat are the four close-ups of one of the most dramatic periods in the history of the people they portray. They say nothing about the discover of a culture rooted in a primitive past, but reveal much about forms of colonialism and extermination within each modernist architecture was one of the most powerful ideological avatars. What happened with this hotel is a very interesting story, which I won't tell you this evening, as I'm still working on this project, the habitat. And it's the habitat because, of course, the discussion of a modernist habitat somehow imply uh, 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 the extermination of other people's habitat. Let me just tell you that there are evidence that indigenous people were used as forced labor in its construction, that indigenous women were subjected to sexual abuse, and that in the early 70s, as the Karaja people revolted against the presence of the Oto in their lands, state officials proposed to build a great wall around the complex as to avoid direct contact with the Indians. So in my work, I'm very much interested in excavating the remains of these ruins and the histories to which they bear witness, histories that were erased, veiled, and forgotten. I'd like to show you then another project that I'm involved with, which I call uh, uh, Archaeology of Violence. 
It was only in the early 70s, when Brazil was under military dictatorship, that Brasilia, the modernist capital, became the de facto center of political power. By the time, the colonial program embodied in the modernist design of the city was rapidly expanding towards the depths of the forest of Amazonia. Like their colonial predecessors, modernist strategists and planners defined Amazonia as a voided space. This colonial perspective, this neo-colonial perspective, led the military dictatorship to design a basin-wide strategy to occupy and integrate the forest, which was translated to a series uh, of radical experiments in spatial planning. This is a map of, uh, uh, that's present in a book of General Golberi da Couto e Silva. This book is called Geopolitics of Brazil. And as you see, uh, he portrays Amazonia as an island, totally disconnected from uh, the political space of Brazil. And he called this a kind of geopolitical maneuver of national integration that would depart from Brasilia, that's located in a plateau, and would somehow engulf the entire forest uh, uh, as a process of colonizing, occupying what they describe as a territorial void. So this kind of uh, uh, idea that Amazonia could be planted as a whole uh, would lead to ideas such as constructing or building an internal lake within the base, in what they call a kind of internal Mediterranean sea within the base. And the military really uh, started to reshape this land completely by drawing this kind of basin-wide uh, planning strategies of which I'm going to show you a few images right now. These planning schemes catalyzed rapid deforestation generating severe, widespread, and long-term impacts in the forest ecology. I like this image very much because it shows that the so-called uh, fish spine patterns of deforestation in Amazonia that we tend to perceive as something that is chaotic, that is the outcome of lack of government, of lack of state policies, is in fact a product of design. So we need to understand how deforestation was a kind of direct product of these kind of uh, uh, modernist designs that were implemented in the forest of Amazonia. Conceptualized and deployed over the basin as a whole, it produced this type of planning strategy, produced environmental change at the scale of the forest. And insofar as Amazonia is the greatest tropical forest in the world, they also produce severe impacts at the scale of the global climate. Indeed, like deforestation in Amazonia, climate change is a product of design. So, during the military dictatorship, what I mentioned as the politics of pacification of indigenous people turned into what the Brazilian Truth Commission described as a politics of erasure, and it became virtually synonymous with a genocidal policy. Architecture and spatial planning play a very important role in that. The colonial perception that the forest interlands constitute a vast terra nullius, sparsely populated by primitive tribes, was translated into an official state policy designed to generate territorial voids de jure and de facto by law and on the territory aiming at eliminating the, the, the existence of indigenous peoples as subjects of rights and exterminating them as a people. So I'm going to show a case that I'm involved with, which is the case of the, of the Waimiria Troari people that live just north of the capital Manaus, central Amazonia. So their land is a land very rich in minerals, and therefore it was designated as what the military called a pole of development to receive roads, dams, mining fields, so on and so forth. And this is the, the plan of pacification that the military drew. So as you see, they could like, they survey the area and they identify several villages uh, which are marked on that map with these uh, uh, dots. And their plan was to take this population and remove them to that uh, uh, big square uh, that is on the top of the other map. And that's precisely what they did. Uh, you see the territory of the Waimiria Troari here before the pacification campaign. And on the other map, what you see is the territory of Wa uh, Waimiria Troari after the pacification campaign. And the pacification campaign is drawn through these arrows. So you see a big dam that was built uh, in their land. You see the road cutting through the middle of their land. Uh, in, in green, kind of light green, you see the mining fields and those arrows they point to where these people were removed. So basically they install 
these indigenous posts all around their land and remove them so their lands could be opened up for colonization. So I started to uh, uh, investigate this case. And what you see is that during this project of pacification, there was a reduction of the population that about 90%, that is to say 90% of the population was decimated uh, uh, during this uh, process. Even when we analyze these statistics, it's practically impossible to access, map, and account for the nature and the scale of the violence that was deployed, deployed against the Waimiria Trori. This is because, in the case of the Amerindian populations, we cannot rely on evidentiary practice that have been traditionally used to investigate state violence during the so-called dirty wars of Latin America. The most important form of evidence by which these conflicts have been investigated has focused on the identification of missing persons, los desaparecidos, the vanished ones. The identification, and this process of identification was very much connected to a kind of identification of the body, right? Exhumations of the body, identification of the victims, so you could give the body back to their loved ones, and uh, you could really sort of map uh, the way that these people have been killed and therefore uh, 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 analyze the patterns of state violence or patterns of state terror. The in, in the case of the indigenous population, this, this type of evidence don't, don't, don't exist. The identification of the body fundamentally relies on a mechanism of individual personification that are internal to the state, implying a given relationship, sits in government, individual nation that the military sought to break and erase, but whose existence is registered in the archives of state bureaucracy, leaving an evidentiary trace of documents and statistics. Hence, one of the most common representations of missing persons, as you can see here, are individual photographs, similar to those using ID cards, passports, police files, medical files, images that denote not only the bodily, but also the legal presence of the disappears as members of a national polity. Evidence of this kind is virtually no existence for the vast majority of indigenous peoples who went missing. There is no birth certificates, no identity cards, no individual photographs, no documents attesting the relationship citizen state, govern government. This is because, under many different aspects, the indigenous people who disappeared were not proper subjects of government, inasmuch as their communities and land had not been completely integrated into the disciplinary and biopolitical mechanism of state control. The state apparatus and its instruments for governing people and land, cartographies, census, laws, the police, were virtually no existence in those areas. And the available statistics on the Waimiria Trori people, as well as other indigenous population, are very scarce, inaccurate, and contradictory. Rather than eliminating citizens from within the social fabric, the violence direct against those populations aimed at factoring them, integrating so-called marginal populations and territories into the body of the nation by transforming them into citizens of the state, by completely transforming their modes of life, thought, and in habitation. It was a form of state-making violence. Because of such a lack of these traditional forms of evidence, indigenous people are subject to another process of disappearance, another process of erasure, for they are not considered political victims of dictatorship. Neither their images, as you can see, appear as part of the cultural iconography that define what is the missing persons. The missing indigenous peoples are somehow the disappeared of the disappeared, a subtle process of exclusion that in a pervasive way accomplishes the politics of erasure devised by the military. The only evidence that we had was this image of one of the villages uh, being uh, uh, burned by arson. So this investigation that I'm going to show you now, it departs from the only existence evidence, this image of the violence. And the main objective of this uh, investigation was to identify the ruins of the village that were erased by the politics of pacification. The rationale of this project was that, in as much as the military attacked an entire mode of life, it was by reading patterns of indigenous habitation that the violence could be mapped and narrated. And the question we asked, how did a devastation on such a scale, which in less than 10 years decimated 9% of the population, did not leave any ruin, any trace. 
right? If this land was occupied, how come that there is no evidence of such a scale of destruction? To assume that this extensive and complex territorial infrastructure that exists in this area completely vanished without leaving ruins or any other material evidence is not only to counterintuitive and seemingly logical. It's also a form of committing another act of erasure of the social historical agents of indigenous peoples, perpetrating the genocidal politics by other means. So in order to overcome this lack of evidence to understand these patterns of violence, we start to look at different modes of, of gathering and reading evidence. Uh, and the assumption here was that it was necessary to read it the terrain under a different gaze, treating the forest as a material that registers index of sociopolitical history. So basically what we did, uh, we start to, uh, uh, we apply, we took this uh, uh, a kind of coding uh, developed by NASA scientists uh, to map uh, global climate change. So what this coding do, it's, uh, uh, it identifies what they call secondary forests or sec second growth forests, that is to say, forests that are not primary forests, forests that has grown in areas that have been deforestated once time. And why do they do this? Because if you want to map the carbon cycle of the earth, you need to understand different patterns of forests. You, you need to understand the botanical constitution of forests, because old forests, they have much more biomass in terms of roots, leaves, trucks. So therefore, they harbor much more carbon. Right? So you need to differentiate very old forests from young forests if you want to understand the cycle of the carbon in the earth. So we took this uh, a kind of coding technique developed by NASA uh, that is it really mapped that you understand nature, and we applied then to understand the histories of violence. So here uh, is uh, uh, an area in the Waimidi Trolley territory, as you see, uh, it has been uh, uh, massively colonized by these agricultural programs, and we ran the code over this image. So let me explain what you're seeing now. Uh, in gray, you see what is called old forests or primary forests. Uh, in black, you are seeing deforestated areas. And in the gradient there, you see different ages of the secondary forest formations. Uh, in purple, you see forests that are over 30 years old, and in light green, you see forests that are six years old, and these follow a gradient, right? So with this technology, we are able really to say that the forest has a history, and we are able to kind of harvest and understand the histories of the forest as a living entity. So we apply the same technology near the Waimidi, uh, on the top of the Waimidi Trolley territory, so you see uh, two contemporary villages, and what we start to identify is that in areas, for example, where there exists no uh, evidence of, of, of presence of indigenous population, we identify traces of anthropogenic modifications in the forests. That is to say, forests that are in fact very new, 30 years old, 12 years old. And, and what is interesting, if you look to uh, one of the footprints of a contemporary village and you apply this coding, you see that in fact the footprint is much larger than what we can see with our optical systems. And we apply the same technology uh, in areas that we knew that there was evidence of people that have been displaced. And we start to notice that all these uh, uh, bubble-shaped spots of uh, 30 years old forest start to appear all around this territory. Uh, more specifically, or more, more, more clearly, uh, near uh, uh, where the dam was built. And we run the same code. And what you see is all these patches of, of modified botanical structures of the forest. And they have a really particular geographical arrangement. They have a particular architecture. They're usually uh, uh, placed next to river streams. And they have a particular distance between one and another. Uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and they are, in fact, quite large. And if you look at them, they're quite consistent with the archival material that we had. So here's the footprint on a contemporary village, and here's the footprint of 30 years old forest.
so they look like tiny interventions, right? They look like just little, these little bubbles in this kind of immense mass of green. But in fact, if you run the code in a kind of large area of, of the wine media territory, what you see is that the whole area was in fact populated. The whole area was occupied by indigenous people. That say there is a kind of urbanism that was present there. There was a kind of like spatial, very sophisticated in a certain way, spatial structure that we can identify. So the nomadic architecture of those settlements, the historical movement of of occupation and abandonment, forced clearings and regrowth created by the villages, left a traceable footprint in the landscape, whose archaeological record can be identified in the botanical structure of the forest. The secondary forest formations that you see, which begin to grow in the 70s, when the violence was most intense, indicated the location of villages that were destroyed or forcibly evicted. Their geography demonstrates that the Brazilian military was not intervening in an empty, void territory, but they reveal, in fact, the existence. In fact, they were not intervening in an empty territory, but in a populated territory. And thereby, they reveal the existence of a planned strategy aimed at disrupting, transforming, or even annihilating modes of inhabiting the forest that were considered the enemy of the project of national development. That is to say, they need to destroy a certain type of mode of relation with the land, a certain spatial structure, a certain urbanism, right, in order to occupy their land with another mode of producing space. And despite all lack of other possible evidence, the memory of the victims of the violence and their histories survive in the living structure of the forest. I want to show you now an excerpt of a video rubber tupper huts. So when they left, these weren't even farmers, they were just transitory people on the landscape. Even transitory people on the landscape can make a difference to the forest. So uh, I've been looking at that more on, on a qualitative, not quantitative basis. You know, I've been seeing what ways this is happening. Abandoned home sites, abandoned fields in Brazil, they call them hosas in port in Brazil, they call them chakras. In other parts of Latin America, they call them canucos or fincas. These are abandoned fields. And the forest, when it comes back, it's not the same forest because they've been planting trees in their fields. Uh, after the annual crops finish, they, it's, a it's a turnover into two perennial crops, fruit trees primarily. Plus, birds and animals drop seeds in the open spaces that the people have created. So, what, the far, what happens when the forest comes back, it's actually kind of a, an orchard, kind of a man-made orchard. And for the untrained eye, it can, it's not obvious. But the more I've been working in the Amazon for 43 years, and it took me a while for me to realize that this forest was not a virgin forest. I always had this romantic idea that humans were you know, destroyers of the forest, that, that they were reducing biodiversity. And so over time, I began to realize the forests I've been walk, walk, walking through. So here is ethnobotanist Nigel Smith, and he's really showing how one can identify the constructed nature of the forest by interpreting certain types of botanical arrangements of the forest. I think, again, uh, 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 you know, we're foreigners or say, people who don't know the Amazon will come to the Amazon and imagine the places of rich in biodiversity, which it is. And I think the assumption is that the biodiversity is richest in areas where people are not, you know, where there's no people around or have not been people around. Somehow an idea of this mythical, again, this mythical idea of the pristine wilderness. But humans, um, have recreated biodiversity. They've rearranged the biological furniture. I love this metaphor of, you know, rearrange the biological furniture because it's really a kind of architectural understanding of what the forest uh, is meant to be. And I think uh, Nigel Smith and this kind of people, they're really teaching us how we can look at the forest, interpret it as a construction. So here is he uh, reading the shape of the canopy. And by reading the shape of the canopy, you can identify that the forest is, in fact, not natural, but is a cultural construction. So here's another type of evidence that this forest is, this patch of forest, it's also not natural. Here what you see is a palm tree garden, and palm trees are really important evidence that forests are human-made. So can we read this as architecture? 
I'm also involved in another project in collaboration with the Shavante people, who likewise the Waimiria Troari were subjected to a violent process of displacement during the military dictatorship. In the case of the Shavante, this is interesting because they are constantly surveyed and monitored by the state. And we can see uh, uh, the image of their villages uh, that were constantly photographed by the state. And not only photographed, but also using a series of aerial photographs and satellite images in order to identify where they were so they could open up their lands uh, for process of colonization. This is a kind of photographic index produced by the US Air Force in collaboration with the Brazilian Air Force uh, in the uh, Chavant territory. So what we are doing in this project, we are kind of taking uh, this apparatus of control, this apparatus of surveillance, and trying to produce a kind of counter-narrative, a kind of counter-cartography, producing a kind of what could be described as a photographic archaeology. Uh, so here's a satellite of uh, a classified mission uh, uh, produced by the US Air Force. And by analyze, by doing a kind of forensic reading of this image, we could identify several traces, uh, the footprints of the Chavante village. So here's the village. There's a kind of earth graphy here. And it's interesting to see that the Shavante people, they don't have written language, but somehow they have a, a, a certain type of written grammar that is inscribed in the earth itself. And again, the footprint of this photographic archaeology is very consistent with this kind of incredible uh, 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 village that the Shavante built. So in the uh, early 90s, in the context of uh, the environmental movements uh, 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 that happened in Brazil, specifically the first UN Earth Summit on the Environment that happened in Rio de Janeiro, the Chavant acquired or exercised the right to return. And they have returned to the land. And this is the map of their land now. But what you can see here, you see that there is this kind of yellow area in all the kind of archaeological complex, all the archaeological heritage of the Shavanti people, they are concentrated in this uh, uh, yellow part. But this yellow part, uh, it was cut out of their land. So what we are doing, we are visiting these areas together with them and really trying to map this archaeological heritage, this archaeological patrimony, and identify what people live there. Uh, 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 and, and what are the remains of those villas? And the remains of those villas, when you go, they're simply trees, right? But those trees, again, they're not just natural landscapes. They're, in fact, human landscapes. They are the very archaeological heritage of those people. In particular, this type of tree, which is called Pequi or Pequizais, which plays a very important role in the cosmology as well as in, in the diet of, of, of the Chavante people. And here is a kind of botanical image of the Pequi. So what we are trying to do with the Chavante is, in fact, submit a petition for the, uh, uh, for the heritage, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, um, how can I say this in English? Uh, the Instituto do Patrimonio Histórico Artístico Nacional, the institute who takes care of the historical uh, uh, heritage and archaeological heritage of Brazil. So we are designing a petition so the government can uh, claim that those trees are, in fact, an archaeological heritage. So the Chavante people, they would have access to those trees. And that's very important. I'm going to show, tell you a little story about this. Uh, when we were uh, uh, traveling to these areas, this is Cacique Damião. And he said he wanted to go uh, uh, towards a much uh, a longer uh, 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 a track to arrive to this village, uh, to go inside a farm. What you see here is a farm now. Uh, this farm now occupies this archaeological site. And he wants to go through this track because there's lots of game there. And there's lots of pequis. And they want to collect the pequis and also us to hunt. So we went hunting before arriving to the archaeological site. So what we can see is that the archaeological site is not only the trees. It's an entire ecology, right? And therefore, that's what one needs to preserve. But how can we preserve, how can we understand the forest itself as a ruin, as an archaeological site, that is to say, as a living uh, ruin. Can we think the same in the same way as we think as we think uh, a kind of traditional ruin? Can we think the forest as such? In the history of Western ideas, forests most commonly represent a threshold against which the human condition is defined, figuring as the territory of humanity's primeval state and its antithesis at the same time. 
This liminal aspect is related not only to the intimate association between the forest environment and the concept of wilderness, but for most refers to the ways in which forest came to symbolize the outside, the negation, or the enemy of the space of the civic, the enemy of the city. The myth of the foundation of Rome tells that the city was built in a clearing carved in a dense forest, what they call silva. Cutting and burning the trees was the first inscription of human design in the landscape. In the Western imagination, the space of the social par excellence is the city, and the forest stands to the city in a relation of fundamental opposition. This image of the forest as a pre-civilizational space inspired modern theories of the social contract from Hobbes to Rousseau, and by the 19th century became entangled with Orientalist geographies of colonialism. Through the narratives of white explorers, colonial administrators, naturalists, and ethnographers, the topical forests of the colonial world were depicted as the Earth's less pristine environments, isolated territories where society was found in its infancy and hu humans remained in a primitive, animal-like developmental stage. Amazonia, the world's great tropical forest, was a kind of very important space through which this power knowledge structure was fabricated and diffused. Until the 70s, descriptions of the nature of Amazonia were dominated by social evolutionist theories that portrayed the region as a hostile environment to civilization. Amazonia was seen as a territory whose nature was as luxurious as it was inhospitable to the development of human societies. One of the most important facts supporting this kind of colonial epistem was the lack of urban uh, traces in the landscape, they say the lack of archaeology. The innovative work of a series of archaeologists, ethnobotanists, are radically changing this view. A series of archaeological findings, as for example the geoglyphs, show that before European colonialism, great territorial expanse of Amazonia were occupied by populous and complex societies that employed advanced special technologies to produce large-scale modifications in the layout of the land. Moreover, the evidence shows that indigenous modes of inhabitation, both in the pre-colonial past and in the modern present, not only leave profound marks in the landscape, but also play an essential role in shaping the forest ecology. Vast tracts of forests and savannas in Amazonia that we perceive as natural environments are in fact cultural landscapes with a deep human past. That is to say, the botanical structure and species composition of the Earth's largest biodiversity refuge is to a great extent a urban heritage of indigenous designs. Since they are part of the living structures of the forest, the nature of this ruin is completely different from the traditional idea of ruin, to the extent that untrained eyes may hardly identify them in the forest landscape, let alone perceive the sophisticated infrastructures, landscape designs, and urbanisms to which they bear witness. Observing, mapping, and understanding this remarkable architecture requires a radical shift in perspective and an exercise in the decolonization of the gaze. Instead of seeing the absence of the city, it's the very concept of the city that has to be widened and transformed. In the same way as read the city as a historical text produced by social forces coded into material form, layers on top of layers of ruins forming a living social fabric, the forest must be interpreted through this syntax of spatial designs. Forests are in fact great archaeological archives which harbor inscriptions, histories, and memories in the living vegetation itself. The spatial distribution of trees, plant species, the geometry of the canopy, the mosaic patterns of forest formations, mild variations in relief and topography, difference in composition of the soil, they constitute architectural records in their own terms. Yet these living ruins are never fully or exclusively human, nor are they completely natural. Heather, they are the product of a long-term and complex interactions between human collectives, environmental forces, and the agency of other species, themselves actors in the historical process of designing the forest. Various indigenous societies not only recognize this constricted nature of the forest, but also extend the boundaries of this cultural political milieu to the multitude of non-human beings housed by the forest. Therefore, for the Makuna, just like the Indians, animals live in communities, in long houses, while the Kishwa of Sarayaku contend that the forest is populated by what they call lactas, villages or towns inhabited by all sorts of beings. As anthropologist Eduardo Viveiros de Castro writes, 
what we in Western culture call environment, the peoples of Amazonia consider a society of societies, an international arena, a cosmopoliteia. Such conception of the forest as a cosmopolis implies that every being that inhabits the forests, rivers, trees, jaguars, and peoples are citizens, that is to say, they're agents or subjects within an enlarged political arena to whom even rights what should be granted. The radical order that the forest presents is not a completely natural landscape, the absolute antithesis or negation to the culturally saturated space of the urban as in the mythology of Rome. It's in fact an altogether different forms of polis itself, one that escapes the spatial imaginaries, political geometries, and epistemic frames of colonial modernity. Confronted with these other ruins, we may need to imagine a different myth of the foundation of the city as the space of the political, where the original design act does not rest on clearing the forest, but rather on the continued practice of its cultivation. So we need to understand the forest as a kind of different political, juridical space and a kind of different cultural space. And to conclude, I just want to uh, now start the topic of my lecture. It's called The Frontiers of Climate Change. So here's analysis of the Chavante land. And what you can see, where we identified several villages that have been displaced, you see the border of their land, we identified several villages outside this border, and you see that the process of displacement is in fact a driving force in deforestation. That is to say, political violence is completely associated with climate change. And this is the type of landscape that one sees in these areas, right? A landscape of plantations, a landscape of harmonization, of the landscape, a, a way of producing the landscape which is based on this idea that we need to homo homogenize land and people. Such a landscape is not only lifeless, harboring much less biodiversity than neighboring forest lands. It's also little. Apart from being com completely contaminated by the fertilizers and chemicals that are used in these huge soy plantations that are occupying these lands, the fabrication of this type of plantation ecology disrupts the life worlds of various species, destroying their habitats and therefore leading to extinction. Consider the life worlds of some of the traditional inhabitants of these lands, as for example, white boars and tapers. As forests are cut and burned, lands are fenced, and plantations expand, wild boars and tapers, like indigenous people, are displaced by the depletion of food and water resources. Here, the mass extinction of non-human forms of life, which according to science is one of the most telling evidence that the planet Earth has entered into the so-called Anthropocene, the age of man, right, or the age of white man, is not an intended fatality. It's in fact the very product of the plantation ecology, the very product of this colonial way of perceiving the forest, being intrinsic to the environmentally destructive colonial logics of capitalism expansion. Extinction is a project authorized by law and perpetrated by design. The plantation is a biopolitics, a modern of governing life, and also a necropolitics, a death machinery. Such a necropolitics not only affect the life words of wild boars and tapers, because wild boars and tapers are are not a collection of individuals. They are, in fact, networks. They are entire socioecology. Again, they play an important function in the diet of these communities, being a primary source of protein of indigenous people, and also occupy a fundamental place in their cosmologies. The Shavant indigenous people told us that wild boars and tapers are disappearing from this area of Amazonia, either because farmers are killing there or because they're being poisoned by soybeans. They are no longer here, they say. Their flesh does not taste as the same before. Fish, too, are disappearing, and also armadillos, and birds, and trees, and the entire forest, and together with the forest, the multiple life worlds sustained by the forest. Tapers and wild boars occupy a radically different, asymmetrical position within the ecology of the plantation and the ecology of the forest. In the plantation, there are pests, the enemy that needs to be exterminated. In the forest, they are a source of life, the companion species that need to be cared and nurtured. 
The foundation of such a symmetry is not only ecological or cultural, it's above all political. It's a political symmetry that draws a line of conflict between two distinct forms of life, two di distinct forms of dealing with life, two modes of relating and producing nature, an ontological clash between incommensurable cosmologies. Politics is not made up of power relationships, philosopher Jacques Rancière wrote. It's made up of relationships between worlds. In the colonial frontiers of Amazonia, this sentence acquires a very concrete, violent dimension, describing a global battle that, within the context of a planet ravaged by environmental destruction, climate change, and extinctions, concerns the very nature of this world and what the changing nature of this world will be. So, I'd like to confront you with these two types of ruins and somehow the Anthropocene, the world that we live is a world of ruins and as anthropologist Anat Singh says, we need how to learn how to live in ruins. And I think here are two models of producing ruins and I think the kind of crucial battle of our time is really how we're going to learn with which ruins we want to coexist and which type of ruins we are going to produce. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>